All right. So as we go through the books of the Bible, um, I don't know how long this is going to take because I don't want to. I didn't want things to be like real long on Sunday nights, but I also didn't want to rush through them. So I figured we'd just go one to three books a, sun a Sunday and see if, you know, probably 20, 30 minutes on helping. So uh, as we go, if there's a certain book, maybe you have more questions about than others, just make sure to ask them. The whole point of this is to make sure that as you're reading through the Bible, you're getting as much out of it as you can. So uh, that's really what we're, what the whole goal is here. Um, we'll start off with the books of the law since they uh, obviously um, are the first ones in the, in the Bible, uh, which consist of the five books uh, called the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Or if you're a fan of psych, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviathan. <laughs> you guys remember that or no? Um, they were written around 1500, uh, but the thing about them uh, is, um, so there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that are that are said about the books of the law, and I'll try to address the, the most important ones tonight, but uh, one is people try to date back to when the Exodus happens, so they can date all the books of Moses that way, um, which puts you to date at about 1446. The problem is that there really is no um, concrete evidence for an Exodus in 1446. Uh, which, you know, shouldn't really concern us that bad. We're talking about ancient history, you know. There's a lot of times when things can just get lost. It's just th things are old. I mean, Egyptians didn't go around recording every single time that they failed. So it shouldn't really concern us that, that much, especially in, uh, keeping in mind that most of the northern Egypt's records have been lost to time due to flooding. The Nile floods quite a bit. Uh, warfare, there's just a lot of stuff that's happened there. And other things like that. And so all things considered, it shouldn't really concern us that bad. But I think a, a, a more reasonable date um, for the Exodus is closer to around 1500. The reason for this is because there's exactly one pharaoh who matches the um, who matches the um, what am I trying to say here? There's one pharaoh that, that, that fits um, the events that happened. Uh, he's got, you know, um, boils on his head and stuff. Uh, it, it seems like he's really the only one who really fits. It's just 30 years off from the traditional dating. So rather than saying uh, 1446, it would be 1479. Uh, not really that big of a leap there. Um, there's a lot of reasons that could account for that 30 years. But long story short, the books of the law as a whole were written in sometime in the 1500s. And uh, Joshua probably kind of... Uh, moved around a little bit, made them a little bit more um, modern to the context that they were written in. And then they were edited sometime around the 1200s. The reason why we know that they were edited is because um, it, throughout them, they talk about things uh, that weren't around at the time. Uh, a good example, that would be Ramses. The, city, the Egyptian city of Ramses wasn't around until the 1200s. But once again, the Exodus is way back closer to the 1500s. So Little things like that where it's like, well, the only way they could have known that is that they were there later, hence the editor. Now, why would the editor do that? Uh, because the area where they built the store cities wasn't very well known, whereas later it was close to where Ramesses was later built. So it would make more sense for people to know where things were to just say the city of Ramesses. Um, but long story short, the editor didn't really change a whole lot. Um, and he probably edited it during the time of the judges. So he, it, it shouldn't make you think that he drastically changed the books, just that he updated some things. That's it. So Moses was still the author. Joshua probably did some stuff. Um, but then there was the editor. Okay, uh, are we ready to start looking at Genesis? Okay, all right. Uh, so Genesis uh, comes from a Hebrew word, Bereshit, which is basically... Uh, in the beginning, which is the first words of Genesis. And that's how it gets its name. Uh, Genesis is made up of a series of historical documents. Uh, and if you read through your Bible, it actually draws attention to this. Not entirely, but um, in large part, it'll say, like, this is the book of this. This is the book of this. And so throughout Genesis, you're going to hit all these little books that make up sections of Genesis. I think one of them is mentioned, and I want to say Genesis 
5 or something. It says, this is the book of the genealogy of something. Maybe that's the of the children of Adam or something. Um, and if you, as you go through Adam, I think, I mean, through Genesis, I think there's a total of five of these books that it's talking about. Uh, Genesis can be broken up pretty easily into two main sections. There's chapters 1 through 11 and 12 through 50. 1 through 11 is all prehistory stuff. And what I mean by that is stuff that is uh, in the distant past. Okay, So, uh, you know, there would be like the flood is in there, the Tower of Babel is in there, uh, the creation of the world is in there, all, all the things that are like way long time ago. And then in 12 through 50 would be more of what's called the uh, patriarchal period. Uh, this is the time of Israel's forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the sons of Israel. Uh, it, it, it fits pretty well in that because you see like humanity on more of a global eh, yeah, global aspect, and then you get more into uh, humanity on a refined aspect going through the family of Israel. Uh, and then um, when you're reading through Genesis, though, not everything is in chronological order. Uh, for instance, uh, you might notice that Abraham his, is recorded, his, his death is recorded fairly early on, but he doesn't actually die way later until, you know, a lot of the stuff with Isaac and Jacob has happened. So, I mean, stuff like that where it's not in chronological order, it just it's formatted that way or, or organized in that way just to kind of... Um, because there's kind of like a flow that, that the author's trying to do. He's, okay, we're going to look at Abraham, and now we're going to look at Isaac, and now we're going to look at Jacob. So he kind of moves some stuff around. Once again, this didn't concern us. It, it, it's not something that he claimed, hey, all this stuff happened in this order. Um, I mean, even the Gospels do that. Um, they had, obviously, some, some liberty that they were able to take. And I think, you know, it's not something that makes it dishonest. It's just something that makes it um, a book. The main events of, of Genesis, I mean, it, it shouldn't be that odd for anybody who's actually read the book, but um, God creates the world and then chooses a, a man and his heirs to be his people. That's the basic, the basic summary of Genesis. And I'll try to give a, a basic um, a summary of every book that we go through. Um, one, th one thing that's kind of funny is there's, there's a tablet that's been found. Uh, that dates, if I remember correctly, dates to the uh, 1200s or so. And in this tablet, it says uh, that the um, talks about the the land of the Shasu of Yahweh, which is the nomads of Yahweh. Um, which, obviously, um, when we think of the nomads of Yahweh, we're probably all thinking Israelites. Uh, but for no apparent reason whatsoever, uh, very well known uh, scholar Daniel Redford takes this and, and he um, attributes it to the Edomites. He says that the that the Shasu of Yahweh are the Edomites, um, and really with no basis for this. And so then he he goes off on this long long excerpt about how. So we shouldn't attribute that to Israel. We should attribute it to the Edomites. So therefore, the Israelites stole their God Yahweh from the Edomites. When the whole time the tablet dates to the twelve hundreds. And the biblical account dates to the 1500s, and there's only one been one people throughout history that's actually claimed to be the people of Yahweh, which was the Israelites. A and uh, so, with, with no with no kind of basis for this off the wall claim, um, you know, he, he does this, and you find this a lot in in scholarship that talks about the ancient ancient world. They kind of they kind of it looks like they kind of try to discredit the Bible when there's really no um, basis for it. Um, and it, if you guys ever read something where a scholar is talking about uh, things of the Old Testament, don't hesitate to, to bring it up and, and let me read it, and I can, I can give the response to it. I actually wrote a paper about the origins um, of uh, Yahweh, and it, I thought it was a very good paper. I typically don't like my papers, but I, I did like that one. So if you guys would be interested in reading it, it talks about Redford's claim and how silly it is. Uh, the main theme of Genesis, uh, if you could summarize the entire book, um, is basically God works it for good. And as you see it all throughout the book, uh, God working things for good. I even in the account of the creation, so you get into verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, And it's almost like this is an afterthought, because it was formless and void. So then he goes straight to the six days of creation. And so it's almost like that's, an a that's a side thought, just so that he can get into the way that God took this 
formless void and gave it order. You know what I mean? Uh, and then you get into uh, the account of, of, of people, and they keep messing things up, and God keeps coming along and, and, and fixing it. You know what I mean? Up until the end where you have Joseph uh, and his brothers, are the, the dad dies, Jacob dies, and the brothers say, oh, no, now Joseph is going to get back at us. He's going he's gonna to make life miserable for us. And, and he makes this comment. He says, no, 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 what you meant, what you sa- intended for harm, God has intended it for good. Um, and this is kind of really the, the summary of the book. And it's interesting that Genesis begins with the idea that God was working and then he rested, and then it ends with the idea that God was working uh, in the through the family and whatnot. Um, kind of this repeating um, theme. Some important ideas that, that come up uh, in, in the book, which is worth mentioning, um, one of the big themes you see is God's people not being like the Canaanites, or that they shouldn't be like the Canaanites. All throughout the, the book, there's this drama of, are God's people going to become like the Canaanites? And you see it repeated over and over and over again. Um, I've mentioned it before on, in messages and stuff, uh, such as Judah, you know, having sex with his dead son's wife and, you know, then trying to kill her for being a whore. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> uh, that's neither here nor there, I guess. Uh, you know, and you see, you see them acting continually and continually more like the people of the land. Um, all throughout the book, it gets worse and worse until Joseph is really the turning point for them, and he doesn't act like the Canaanites at all, and as a result, they all end up in Egypt. Um, so, as you're, as you're reading, kind of pay attention to that, and you'll kind of pick it up and pick up on, on that, that theme, the very resounding theme. Um, another big theme of Genesis, another idea, big idea of, of Genesis, is uh, the idea of restoring people to God. Um, it happens from the moment, really, they're getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Um, you know, God is God is trying to trying to reunite them with Himself, and I'm going to give three examples of that. So, uh, this is kind of like the seeds of the salvation mes- message, the seeds of the gospel message. The first is when um, when they first sin in the Garden of Eden, and God is talking to the serpent, and He says that they will man will crush his head even as the serpent is striking uh, his heel, which is the first little reference to, to Jesus crushing the work of Satan um, that we see. And then later, um, we have this really odd story of uh, Noah's three sons. Okay, so there's um, Shem, Ham, and uh, Japheth. And I want to say it's Ham and goes in and sees his father uh, naked. <laughs> sees his father naked. And he decides to go out and ri- ridicule his father. Um, <laughs> gross thing to do, but <laughs> the whole thing, the whole story is kind of gross. Uh, and so you, you have this, this, this interesting thing that happens because when Noah finds out, he doesn't curse Ham. He curses Ham's son, which I always thought was odd. Um, and so, you know, he, he, ta- he talks about how Canaan is going to be, going to be cursed and all this. And then he makes this, this interesting comment. He said that he will dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, there, because of the way this sentence is structured, it, it can really, it's kind of ambiguous. But, um, I want to say it was, um, it wasn't Craig Keener. It was Craig, um, mm, I wish I could remember his name. He wrote a book called The Promised Plan of God. And he made a very uh, good argument for um, that it should be translated, and and God will dwell in the tents of Shem, which makes sense when you keep in mind that the people of Israel came through the family line of Shem. Uh, so this is obviously a second time that the Bible is talking about the salvation is going to come um, through that family line. And then the third one worth mentioning is was one that I'm sure you guys all know about. It happens in Genesis 12, uh, 1, where God says, Through you, Abraham... I will bless all the nations. Um, and uh, there those three are, are, are clear indicators of the coming salvation. So Genesis has a lot of things like that. And when you get into the into the tabernacle being built in Exodus, it has a lot of uh, imagery in it that is reminiscent of um, uh, paradise, being reunited with God. So Satan does appear in the story. 
but he's referred to as a serpent. Uh, there, there's, there's two basic camps. Uh, one is that the, the serpent in Genesis and in the, in the Garden of Eden was actually a serpent. Uh, I'm not a part of this this camp. I, I'm part of the other camp, and the reason why is just because of the context of how um, how people wrote. Th- there was this there was this uh, kind of device that they used when they were writing. I'm not sure if it qu- classifies as poetry or prophecy, but the idea is where you say where you attribute something to something that already is. Okay, so like uh, what I mean by that is like okay, so the ser- a snake was created by God on whatever day of creation. Uh, fifth or whatever, uh, and with that, with it being created, it crawled on its belly. That's that's what snakes do. They crawl on their belly. So then, God is talking to to Satan and says that he will crawl on his belly like a snake, like snakes do. It's it's something where you attribute it after the fact, and this is something that that was actually very common um in these kinds of older writings, which is why I I go on to the camp that it wasn't actually a literal snake. However. Um, once again, this is this isn't really something that you lose your faith over. I mean, it's not, you're not going to like leave sal- lose your salvation whichever way you lead. It's it's not that big of a deal. So if it was a, a snake, obviously snakes don't talk, so we can assume that Satan was talking through the snake. I'm guessing um, it wouldn't be the first time that uh, somebody has talked through an animal. Well, actually, it would be the first time somebody's talked through an animal, but it wouldn't be the last time somebody has talked through an animal. So uh, let's see. So some things to consider about this book that I, I feel like uh, is really a big, um, a big point to make, and that's this. Let me say this. Genesis has never been looked on with more doubt than it currently is being looked on, uh, and the reason for that is obvious. I think we we live in a scientific age where people don't really want to um, allow for things that doesn't fit their kind of preconceived bias of how the world operates, which is weird um, because now that's kind of changed in the last 10 years with the whole transgender thing and everything where people aren't really concerned so much about scientific fact as, as how I feel about something and what truth I claim over something. So it's kind of a, a weird time to be alive because they'll, they'll deny the Bible because it's, you know, scientific reservations, but then they'll support the transgender movement with no scientific claim to it, and it's it's a weird time to be alive because you try to you try to argue the Bible or explain the Bible and stuff, and it's kind of like talking out of both sides of their mouth, and it's just it, it's really difficult. Um, but uh, there's still some things that we can say. First off, is Genesis is not a science book. A lot of people have made a lot of effort trying to go to it uh, to solve all their scientific dilemmas. You're not going to find it here. Uh, yes, obviously the Bible says some things that happen, but science is more concerned with. Um, what's happening, and the Bible is more concerned with how it is happening. So uh, what I mean by that is when science looks at a thunderstorm and they say, okay, this is what's, ha- excuse me, what's happening, whereas the Bible would say God made the thunderstorm. It's a completely different focus. Uh, and another thing is the Bible isn't a history book. It contains history in it, but it was r- not written with the idea of history. It was written with the idea of there are spiritual reasons that we need to be looking at. Um, for instance, why is it important to the Bible that we understand that God created everything? See what I mean? There's a lot of important reasons why we should know that, that God created everything. Scientifically, is it important that we know that God created everything? Not necessarily, because in science we're more concerned with test tubes. Like, can we test this hypothesis? You know what I mean? And it's just a whole different idea to it. The Bible's not really concerned about those things. It doesn't. It doesn't care if you go and get rent this from the bi- from the library and uh, like, you know, give a four star or five star review. It's interested in teaching you about God. And so the creation account teaches us a lot about God. It teaches us that He's all powerful. Uh, it teaches us that there was not some cosmic battle. In all the other creation accounts from other sources, other ancient sources, there's this cosmic battle that's going on. There's none of that in Genesis. Uh, another thing that you see uh, is there's typically some kind of emission from the gods that causes life to grow. But that's not what happens in Genesis. You, you have God speaking by the word of his power. And you, you have a lot of these different things that show us that he is God, all-powerful, which might not seem like that big of a deal, but the idea that God is a completely independent being is pretty pretty singular to the Bible. 
most other accounts of God is limited drastically. Uh, there's a lot of divisive stuff that you're going to see online that says you have to be part of this camp or this camp, and people get real heated. Uh, I just want to encourage you to kind of stay away from those kinds of things online. <laughs> Uh, there's scholarly articles and there's books and stuff, but even there, there's a lot of divisiveness in it. So just be careful with you know what you what you read and watch and those kinds of things. It, there's a lot of times people kind of claim things that they don't really know about. Um, th- there's just a lot more to it. Um, a good example of this would be uh, evolution, right? So everybody has an opinion on evolution. I just say the word and probably everybody. Eh. Uh, yeah, everybody just already has an idea of what they believe, and that's fine. Uh, you believe whatever you want to believe. Uh, but one thing I, I think is important is you're going to read a lot of stuff about, you know, um, if you're a Christian, you have to believe this one view of certain things. Um, a good example of that was when I was a kid, there was this idea that um, it was called the <coughs> something to do with, what is it called? Something to do with a a cloud of water that covered the earth that went away at the time of the flood. What was it called? I don't remember what it was called. But, uh, and, and there was this kind of this idea going on that if you were a good Christian, you believed in this view. Well, that's a good example of sometimes it's more divisive than anything. And I think it's important to remember the words of the New Testament where he talks about not allowing yourself to be taken in by these pointless arguments that are just causing division that don't really do anything. Let's say, for instance, hypothetically, Jason believes in evolution and I steadfastly do not. Is he going to lose his salvation over that? No, he's not. He's not. He's just not. So, I mean, there comes a point when you have to al- allow that there are some things that are big deals and some things that are not big deals. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get at here. Um, especially in, in light of today. Oh, my goodness. There's just people are devise, divided over everything. And even more so, uh, they re- can read a book like Genesis and they oh, well, that's not scientific. That's not really what happened. It's just a fairy tale. It's just a myth. So, uh, you know, the Word of God is still the Word of God. God is still in control. He still has a plan. We don't have all the answers. We can trust God. We don't know exactly what it looked like when God created things. We just know that he did. So there's a lot of a lot of kind of, you know, things that we have to be okay with not knowing the answers. Here's a good example. Um, the Bible says that God created light before he created the sun and that plants grew before he created the sun. Well, how is that possible? See, stuff like that where it's like, well, you're not going to get all the answers. And you have to be okay with not having all the answers. It's just something that you have to be like, okay, well, I don't know exactly what this means, but I know I can get the, I can get the big event here. God created everything. God's in control. I can get that regardless of whether I understand every single aspect of it. Um, and, th- you know, that does take us into the area of faith. I mean, w- there's a lot of reasons to believe in the Bible. I think science actually affirms the Bible. Uh, such as the Big Bang. I think the Big Bang is affirmed by Genesis 1. But uh, these are things that ultimately y- you have to understand that no matter how, an- how many answers you get, there's still faith at the end of the day. Um, we do not know how old the earth is based solely on the Bible. The Bible does not carry all, all the dates. It, it doesn't really care how old the earth is. It, it, and here's another little, little thing that, that um, bothers people. Is that modern dating limit? Modern dating um, methods, modern modern dating lim- methods, gee whiz, uh, are very much so limited. So we have something called carbon dating, but the problem with carbon dating is it is only accurate after you get past a certain amount of time. So the question being, well, how do you know that it's actually a- accurate past that certain amount of time? The answer is you don't. I mean, I can say, oh, I carbon dated this to 20,000 years ago. I wasn't alive 20,000 years ago. I don't know if I'm right. You see what I mean? Uh, and then there's the obvious, obvious thing of, okay, so after s- how long, how long before carbon dating becomes irrelevant again? Is it after 100,000 years? Like after 100 billion years? Like when is the cutoff where, where carbon dating stops being accurate? And we don't know that either. Um, so we're, 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 lim- we're, we're very much limited with dating. So it's best if you don't kind of just stay away from arguments about how old the earth is. Uh, we weren't there. <laughs> people will go back and forth, and a lot of people make a lot of good arguments. Ken Ham uh, is a really big um, short earth, young earth uh, creationist, and he has a lot of good, good points. But then you get to other guys, and they give a lot of good points for why it should be, uh, why it's a longer period. Okay. 
they'll go back and forth as to whether the days in the creation are ages or days. You know, it, it, it doesn't really matter for the for that you understand. God created everything. I mean, it's, that's the big thing. So let's let's not lose the force of the trees here. Um, a, a few other things that worth mentioning um, is have things aged at the same rate since their creation. So uh, scientists talk about the singularity, right? So this is the event that started the Big Bang. If you and, and the the universe is expanding out. So hypothetically, if you just go backwards, you can kind of see when time began. If the expansion rate has stayed the same for all those years. See what I mean? Because if it's changed, like let's say it started out really fast and it kind of slowed down. I don't know. Like maybe God did it and then he was like, okay, let's slow down, guys. I don't know. It doesn't say that. Uh, another thing is, was everything made with age or not? Think about Adam. When, when Adam was created, he wasn't created as a newborn baby, was he? I hope not. <laughs> Let's let's create a baby and leave it here on the ground. Have a, good luck. <laughs> like you, you know, I I would think that God would create him with some kind of age so he could actually name the animals and be in the garden and stuff. That makes sense, right? So if God would make man with 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 age, what did it look like for Earth to be young? Like you know what I mean? I, I, to a certain extent, Earth would have had to be created with age because it takes thousands and millions of years for mountains to be created. So I'm assuming that he created it with some sort of age. I'm assuming, but once again, these are these are assumptions, so I don't know. Um, but there is something that I think is funny that I, I always bring up because I, it just tickles me <laughs> in a way I like being tickled. So uh, people, there's a lot of times when people, I'm just going to call them anti-evolutionists, okay? They'll rant and rave against evolution, which is okay. I understand that. It's kind of an irritating thing the way that they're trying to cram it down kids all the time. Uh, I get that. But here's where it gets funny. Um, at the same time that they're raving against evolution, they're teaching evolution. And this is what I mean. They say things like this. Well, there was no death before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And it makes sense, except who made the tiger? Well, didn't God make the tiger? D tigers can't live without eating meat. So there had to be some form of death for the tiger to live, unless you're teaching evolution, in which case, after the fall, animals evolved into what they are now. It, it's it's one of the it's 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 the conundrum of creationism. You have to either affirm evolution, God did evolve the animals, or you have to affirm death before the fall. And the is is, is relatively simple. Um, the Bible never says that there was not death before the fall. It never says that. In Romans, it talks about the way that spiritual death came from the fall. It does not say that death in total, and I, I want to encourage you guys to read through Romans this week and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. But if you, you know, disagree with that idea, just keep in mind you do still have to answer the question of did God evolve the animals or did he not? And uh, then we have obviously the idea about the snake being changed from an animal that had feet to not having feet. That sounds a lot like evolution to me. You know, and you you go through all these different things. It's like, you know, be consistent in your belief. If you don't believe in evolution, then don't teach evolution. If you do believe in evolution, then teach evolution. But you got it. You got to be able to answer those hard questions and say, okay, um, what do I actually believe? And is that belief going to stand up to people disagreeing with me, or does my does my belief cave? And that's that's a problem. If you're not able to look at your Look at your thoughts. There's a lot of things that I, I believe currently that I don't have good reason to believe. You know what I mean? I believe that God is a healer even though my mom died, my grandpa died. See you know what I mean? All these different things. I, I have no, no earthly reason to believe these things. That, that's faith. And the same is true for, for Genesis. I can believe that God did something this way or did something this way and not have proof to back it up. You know what I mean? But anyways, um, and just in case there are any people here who believe in evolution, I just want to throw this out there. Uh, different animals having similar DNA doesn't, isn't proof for evolution unless you already believe in evolution. <laughs> unless I already believe in evolution, a monkey's DNA being similar to my DNA isn't proof unless I already believe that. So just something to sn stick in your uh, pipe. Can you believe in evolution in Genesis? Oh, this is a question I am unfortunately messed with too too much. 
Uh, in my younger years, I kind of felt it was my duty to try and persuade everybody to my opinion. Uh, uh, I don't really see that anymore. I, I'm going to say this. I believe that you can believe in evolution and Genesis. I believe that if you if he did do evolution, if by some by some miracle God did use evolution, there, there's some things that this can teach us. First off, that God does things in processes all the time, right? So he said people wouldn't live past 120 years, right? Well, didn't they live past 120 years after he said that? Well, yeah, he did. Yeah, they did. Does that mean God's a liar? No, it means that God does things in time. He, t- he takes time to do some things. When God saved you, did you instantly never mess up ever again? Well, no, you're going through the process of salva- salvation. And it's kind of like that. So if by some miracle God did use evolution, it's not something that we have to lose our faith over. It's just God does things in, in time. So, okay. Uh, whatever you believe, the important thing is, especially in, in the divisive times that we're in, um, w- something that is always important to keep in mind is don't overshadow what the Bible teaches with your experience or your science or your commonly held ideas. Okay, So just because everybody in the whole world believes in evolution or whatever doesn't mean that you should allow that to overshadow what the Bible... T- and we do this on a very uh, sub, very subliminal level. level. We'll read the, the creation account and all this, and in the back of our head we're thinking, yeah, but... Like the whole thing about plants living. Yeah, yeah, I know he created it like that, but, I mean, obviously the sun was there before, so I, I, I don't understand that. I can't really give an answer to it. Um, but it's important that when we're reading the Bible, we let the Bible be the Bible. We don't have to rush to understand it in, in light of our science or our world or, you know, whatever. There's a lot of people who have actually made a habit of translating the Bible according to, you know, um, racial tensions that are going on right now. And it's, it's just not really the idea. Um, you you kind of want to stay away from those, those kinds of things and try to understand the Bible for what it was at the time. Um, and part of this is realizing that every every view has a counter argument. Every view has a has a hole to it. Um, you know, in, in evolution, for instance, there's a lot of holes to the theory of evolution, but there's a lot of holes to our belief in creationism. That once again, we can't have full answers for. And I'm not trying to say that God's not reliable, but I'm trying to say that. W- in the coming years, you're going to be talking with more and more people who see Genesis as a myth. It's going to be more, not less. So I'm trying to equip you and prepare you. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just saying you're going to be coming into, into contact with a lot more people who believe in an anti-Bible worldview. And the correct way to address it appears to not be to go into arguments about evolution. It's just not that big of a deal. The main thing of the Bible is that we need to be saved from our sin. And I think that we do well to kind of keep that at the primary. Um, Because at the end of the day, they're putting their faith in man having all the answers, and we are putting our faith in God already has all the answers. (laughs) So, uh, you know, don't let it shake. You just realize that if you get roped into that kind of an argument, it really isn't going to have a good outcome. It's going to be kind of pointless. So if you can, try to just guide it back to Jesus and keep Jesus as the main thing. Um, because these, there's always a loophole in every belief system. There's always an unanswerable question. It doesn't matter if you're talking about creationism or evolution or, or any other idea that comes up. There's always going to be a, I gotcha, a zinger. And, you know, uh, y- you can become a master of argument or you can become a master of, of telling people about Jesus. Um, let's see. But there's a lot of things that, that the Bible answers that our scientific world still can't answer. Um, they don't know the origin, what caused the Big Bang. We do. Uh, they don't know how non-life can spawn life. We do. Uh, they don't know why everything in the world and the universe has order. In fact, so much so that we have the laws of the universe. Well, we do. We do know these things. Um, but obviously, if you go to it with that arrogant attitude of, I have all the answers, you're just kind of looking to start a fight. So so what about Genesis? You read through Genesis, and you've got this story about these cosmic things happening and then this family line of, of, of Israel forming and all that. So what? What is the point of Genesis? Why even bother with the book? And I think that all things considered, we can 
one of the big things we can take from Genesis is that God is not fighting with other gods. There's no cosmic struggle. He is a creator, and he is a sustainer, and he's an ever-present help. You see that all throughout the book. And I think that as long as we keep that in mind, all these distracting arguments about, you know, historicity of Genesis and, and evolution, all these different things, I think if we just keep that as the main thing, we can always learn something from Genesis, um, we, which is a very important, uh, very important book. I mean, without Genesis, there's a lot of questions that we wouldn't have answered, and, and I think that it would really make us feel a lot less um, created on purpose. So I want to take some time and just say, hey, do you guys have any questions about Genesis from your own studies? Anything that you read and you think, this is crazy or wild, I just don't understand this, why was this? Anything like that? Remember, if you think of anything, stop me. The whole point of this is to make sure you guys are, are getting the most that you can from the Bible. Um, and and uh, back to the whole thing that I kind of belabored. Uh, if you do get in an argument with somebody and they really rock your faith, just come talk to me. I, I can I can always point you in the right direction of resources. A lot of the arguments I've actually encountered, ha- you know, first person. Um, and uh, don't let it don't let it be something that bothers you. It, first off, it's not a big deal. I already mentioned that. But saying it off, even if it's like the this is something that rocks your faith to the core. There's usually an answer for it. You know, it's just you just got to give it time. Uh, a lot of time, a lot of times, I've talked to people that, oh, I used to go to church, but there were just so many contradictions in the Bible, and nobody ever answered my questions. I don't want to ever have somebody leave the church for that. If you have questions about the Bible, or about science, or all these different things, ask me. If I don't know the answer, I at least know where to point you at. I mean, don't don't get hard harder towards God because of an- unanswered questions. Um, do you guys want to go on to Exodus, or do you want to stop there? If you, who wants to go? Go on through Exodus. Who wants to go on to Exodus? Nobody? We want to stop? Okay, does anybody want to leave? Okay, we're going to go. We're going to go on to Exodus now. Uh, So that takes us to the book of Exodus. Um, Exodus is is, is an interesting book uh, because it's called Exodus, which sounds like it makes sense. But the whole reason why it's named Exodus uh, is because uh, there's a Greek uh, Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint. It's the Greek Bible that, that Jesus read. And uh, it, I don't really want to get into the story of why it's called the Septuagint. But the long story short, in the Septuagint, <coughs> in the Greek, it's called the book of Exodus. But in the Hebrew, it is not called the book of Exodus, even though that makes sense. It makes a lot more sense to call it the book of Exodus. In Hebrew, it's actually called Shemot, which means names. Yeah, Exodus is actually called in Hebrew the book of names, which annoys me to no end (laughs) because it doesn't have a bunch of names in it. Genesis had a bunch of names in it. Why did you call Genesis names? I mean, ah. But here's the thing. Um, Verse 1 starts out something along the lines of, these are the names of the family family of Israel or something like that. I don't remember exactly how it starts. So that's where you get the names from. It starts off with, these are the names. So uh, besides that, it's also one of the highlights of the book is Yahweh's, um, Yahweh's talking with Moses where he says, I am that I am. Uh, and so obviously he's talking about his name to Moses and the Israel's name, Moses. And uh, one of the things about ancient names is they oftentimes uh, kind of um, offer commentary on things. Um, names had meaning to them. Uh, so the fact that it includes Yahweh, it, it's kind of like, hey, God is showing himself as the God who is. So throughout Exodus, you're actually seeing God revealing himself as I am that I am. Um, it's one of those kind of resounding themes that repeats itself. Now, in a lot of scholarship, they, they hold to a view of what's called um, JEDP. And the basic uh, theory behind this is that the books of the law are compilations they weren't written by Moses, they're compilations. And so there's a bunch of different traditions from, from different areas of the ancient world. Remember, in this mindset, Israel is not Israel. They're Canaanites who are just one of many Canaanites. So these Canaanite people, there's different traditions in the areas. And so they have, throughout time, eventually taken all these uh, traditions and put them together into one, one or five books. Uh, there, there's numerous problems with this theory. First off, for good reason, it stopped being the primary focus of scholars because they realized how shoddy the, the argument was. The second thing is we have never found any proof to substantiate the claim that there were these different documents, J, E, D, and P. 
never any proof. Uh, and none of our ancient copies of, of, of the books of the law, none of them are broken up into these sections ever. There's been no fragment called J or, or having the information of J found. It just, it just doesn't exist. Um, another little problem with it is that the books of the law have too much unity. You can read through the book of Exodus, for instance, and see the main argument of the book. You can kind of see it has good flow to it. The characters are the same. You don't have people just dropping in out of nowhere. It's just, it, it, it doesn't, it, it, there's not that. Another thing is there's different parts that should have differences that don't. For instance, in, in the JEDP um, hypothesis, there's this idea that different traditions of the Jews had uh, different names for God. But when you get to those parts in the, in, the, in the books of the law that are supposed to have these big differences, they aren't there. So all these, uh, th- this, this, this big thing that scholars were really pushing, it's a compilation of a bunch of different traditions that's not historical. There's nothing to it. And the thing is, if you read a lot of those, his- those scholarly articles, you're going to find that there's really nothing. I mean, it's a house of cards, but everybody talks about it so firmly. And it's similar to the whole thing going on with, with science and, and evolution and all that. So... Anyways, uh, so then you get to chapters, uh, I mean, Exodus, it can basically be broken up into two sections. A little bit unfairly, three sections is really better, but we can do it in two to keep things simple. Uh, chapters 1 through 18, Israel's Exodus. And then 19 through 40, uh, God, the, the God is starting to dwell with his people. And that looks like the covenant gets going and the tabernacle is built. Uh, kind of an important uh, event in the history of the Jews. Uh, one of the, some of the ways that we know that the um, Exodus actually happened is that the Jews celebrate Passover, and they still do. For something to have that big of national unity, it's very unlikely that it would be a made-up event because people don't hop on for something that didn't actually happen. Uh, July 4th, right? We, we Everybody in America knows about July 4th because of what actually happened in 76, right? So, I mean, everybody knows this. It's not something that, I mean, we all nationally understand it. And uh, something similar can be argued for this. I mean, historically, you can't have a holiday, a national holiday, just appear out of thin air without having some kind of a historical basis to it. Um, It's just, that wouldn't make any sense. And the fact that they still observe it now shows that there's some kind of importance to it. Um, Besides that, some other other proofs. Now, I want to talk about proofs for just a second. Archaeology doesn't give us all the answers, okay? There's actually a lot of things that we don't know from archaeology. Uh, things get lost. Things haven't been found. In fact, there's a very small percentage of all the ancient sites that have actually been uncovered, and those who have been uncovered are either damaged or haven't been fully excavated. <laughs> and then there's, like, lots of other little little things. They, they would do this thing called a tell, and a tell is where they would build a city on top of a city. So you have multiple layers all kind of converging together, which makes it very difficult to recover anything <laughs> because everything get, all the layers get mess, mixed up and you're having people reusing some bricks for other things and pottery getting mixed up and that's one of the big ways that they date things is, is the pottery left over well if you've got pottery moving to the different layers i mean you everything just gets a <laughs> uh, too much too much so long story short you know there, there's a lot of things that we just don't we just don't know about this. Maybe a better way of breaking up Exodus would be breaking it up into three parts. There's the Exodus at the beginning, and then there's like this this little bit of a desert wandering for a couple chapters while they're kind of trying to find their way to Sinai. Uh, and then there's the actual bit at Sinai. Uh, however you want to break it up, though. Uh, what happens in the book? Uh, God's people, Israel, are slaves in Egypt, and God leads them out through uh, Moses. And the covenant is ratified at Mount Sinai. Uh, tabernacle is built as a sign that the covenant has been ratified. So the main theme, then, of Exodus is that God works to save. Exodus is really a book about redemption. It's a book about salvation. And you see this happen in a lot of different ways. The first way is they are redeemed from slavery. Uh, The second way is they are redeemed from their own sin when they build golden calves and worship it. Uh, You know, you just see this resounding theme throughout really the whole book. Um, The tabernacle, though, was was a very big sign for, for the Jews because it was um, it was kind of like a way of saying, hey, God is dwelling with us. That's a whole idea. It was his tent. Um, and so he's, he's dwelling with his people. Um, the, the blood of the Passover is another sign that God was, God was working on their behalf. Now, they didn't really get it at the time. Um, there's a lot of times in the Old Testament where God will give a message or something, and it'll just kind of, the audience will miss it. You know what I mean? And the Passover is one of those things. The blood on the on the post, like, hey, yeah, that that that's good. They didn't really under, they didn't really get the catch over that they needed blood on their hearts. They didn't they didn't get that. So when Jesus came and he offered that, 
it was like, well, this is blasphemy. You know, why don't, don't put that he's the king of the Jews? He's not the king of the Jews. So some things to consider about Exodus that, that kind of make the book very unique is uh, it, it lists the, the plagues of Egypt, which I'm, I'm positive you guys are all very familiar with, so I'm not going to break it down. Uh, if there's anybody watching on the live stream, read Exodus. Uh, plagues, uh, the plagues of Egypt are very interesting because they're really a power struggle between Moses, who, ya- who Yahweh said he would make like God to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh. See, at those times, Pharaoh was to the Egyptians, not actually, but to the Egyptians, he was a god. And so it was a power struggle between the god of Egypt and the god of Israel, uh, which Moses was walking, was, was acting as the god. It was, he was acting in Yahweh's place. He was like, like a representative. That's a way of saying that. Um, and so for all intents and purposes, to Pharaoh, Moses was uh, the manifestation of the divine. Uh, and so then uh, another thing is you kind of see this, this rocking of the beliefs of, um, of Egypt as a whole. Uh, for instance, the Nile um, was the giver of life. It had a lot of, you know, um, spiritual meaning for the, for, the, for the Egyptians. God turns that sucker to blood. <laughs> you know, and then you have the different things like the, fl- uh, the, the frogs and stuff that, that meant something to the Egyptians. And one by one, they just see them knocked down. Now, uh, some people make the claim that God was systematically going through their gods, and, and he was not doing that. Uh, but some of the things did have spiritual significance uh, to the Egyptians. Uh, the sun, obviously, Amun-Ra, who made his voyage across the day, across the sky during the day, and then would go into the underworld at night and battle the hordes of the demons and then come back in the next day. Well, you see it blotted out into darkness, and it's like, ah! So, uh, so some important things for the Egyptians, uh, and, and never forget that Exodus did happen in a historical context. Uh, another thing that's kind of important to kind of clear out is a lot of people think that Yahweh revealed his name to Moses in Exodus. He did not. Okay, In Genesis, in Genesis, uh, I believe it's Abraham, names, uh, names a certain place. And I don't remember the name of the place. I can look it up if there's anybody who's interested. Um, he names the name of a certain place with the name of Yahweh. How could he have named the place with the name of Yahweh if he didn't know the name of Yahweh? Unless you're trying to make the argument that afterwards they lied about what he named it and they just made it up. In which case, now you're saying that Genesis isn't historical. So that's a whole different claim that you need to validate if you're going to you know, move that direction. Some important ideas that happen in Exodus. <coughs> God saving Israel didn't excuse them from living for him. Just because God singled out the Israelites doesn't mean that, okay, we're off the hook now. Uh, we've been slaves, so we have the, r- the wrong has been righted so we can live however we want. Um, another thing is the tabernacle's construction. Uh, if you've read through Exodus, no doubt, somewhere in the middle, you get kind of bogged down. And the reason why is because he says, build the tabernacle exactly like this. And he goes into very, very precise detail. And then at the end of the book, he says, and they did. And then he goes into exact precise detail, saying what he just said he was going to say. And it's like, couldn't you just summarize all that and said, and they did. But, but no, it is step by step, every single thing reworded. Uh, it gets a little bit tedious to us. But it's something very important that happens in that whole thing is these two accounts are broken up in the middle by the story of the golden calves. This is significant because Israel almost annulled their covenant. Almost. Uh, They they came this close. Uh, Before they even finished setting the thing up, they almost annulled it. And this was a major stress point because they didn't know at that point, we know the end of the story, but they didn't know at that point whether God was going to take them back or not. And so Moses has to go and try to plead on their behalf that, that God would take Israel back. And you're at this really stressful situation, and then God, God and here's, here's the problem, is now we have a question of God's goodness. Because he punished Egypt for these things, and now Israel's doing it, and now he's saying, oh, it's okay for them? So this is a big issue. Now, now God's character is at stake. And God says this to explain it. He says this, I'm going to forgive them, and I will, what does he say? He says, I will... I will show mercy to who I will show mercy and wrath to who I will show wrath. And that's the only explanation that he gives. And then he takes them back, and the covenant it goes on forward. And the interesting thing is if you take this story out, the whole story of the golden calf, you just take it out, and you just read it through and skip that story, the ending, the, 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 it, could, it could naturally be removed and just have a nice flow to it. And my point I- is this, that after they had done this big thing, it was just as if they had never even done it. 
God forgive them so completely that the story just completely goes back where, it's, where, where it left off at. It's almost like an unnecessary twist in the road. Because by the end of the story, we're right back to the, okay, so anyways, so they were building the tabernacle, and it's like, didn't, weren't they on probation or something? No, they weren't. They were just forgiven, and everything was fine, moving on. Which is amazing. Obviously, you know, there were a lot of them that were killed by God. <laughs> so there is that. <laughs> there is that. But I mean, as a nation as a whole. So, mm-mm, just a few last things. Um, Oh, uh, I guess the last thing. The Bible I- is, is very interesting because if you wanted to make up a story so that you could have a claim on land, this is our land and I've got this story to back it up, you would probably make yourself out in the best light possible. And the people who you conquered, you'd probably make them out to be like really big jerks. That's not what uh, what these uh, these books show us. In fact, in Deuteronomy, Moses goes off on the people of Israel and says, "If it wasn't for you, I'd be in the Promised Land." And it's like, okay, calm down there, buddy. You know, and you you have again and again them showing up the failures of Israel. You have Moses messed up, Aaron messed up, the people messed up, and it's again and again and again. It's not like one time. These people aren't people that you'd pick out of a lineup to save. You'd say, okay, you want to do that? Go back to Egypt. Enjoy your time in slavery. And that's the ironic thing is they actually say, oh, back in Egypt, we had it so good. And that's exactly what we would have done if we were God. Yeah, go back to Egypt. Have a good time. Adios. There's plenty of other people to pick from. And uh, so anyways, it's, it, it's very interesting that, that uh, you know, it doesn't go to great lengths to paint people as heroes or in a good light, uh, which strongly argues for the fact that it isn't just a made-up story because why would you make your heroes into bad guys? Why would you do that? Um, so so what about Exodus? Okay, you've read it. You've gone through the whole thing. So what? Who cares? What does it matter that's in the Bible? Well, because in Exodus, God begins a story of redemption. This is a very important point. And he shows his long suffering throughout all the books of the law, really. In Genesis, he says this to Abram. He says this, know for certain that, you're, that, you're in, and that, you're, that your children are going to go spend time in captivity. And then he says this, he says, because the, time, the, the iniquity or the sins of the Amorite is not yet complete. In other words, the Amorites have more time before I'm going to punish them. I'm going to give them more time. F- over 400 years later, they finally come back, and the Amorites still are not destroyed. It's, they're given more time, and more time, and more time. See what I mean? So then you get into Exodus, and you see God's people worshiping a golden calf, and yet they're still given more time. You see again and again and again this idea of God's long suffering. And so what does Exodus offer that other books of the Bible don't offer? I think it offers a very important lesson of redemption. It points forward to the coming Messiah probably more than any of the rest of the books of Moses. And it really it really has a lot to teach us about how God, you know, dealt with people. And I, I Personally, it's my favorite of the books, books of the law because I just, I just really like the stories in it. But, um, you know, I think, I think um, Exodus does some things that no other book of the Bible does. And I would say that obviously in the Old Testament, it's the biggest um, affirmer of God being a redeeming God. But even when compared with books of the New Testament, you still have, it, it really holds its own. So, uh, yeah. Any questions about, gen- about Exodus? Um, the whole point of this class is to make sure, or st- study, not class, study, is to just a- make sure we, any questions you guys have about the Bible is answered. I've said this now, this is the third time. So if you guys are reading anything in the Bible and it doesn't make sense, please ask. Worst comes to worst, I have no idea. That's the worst case scenario. So, I mean, it's worth asking. <laughs> like, uh, you know, uh, th- I've been to a lot of churches where, where people wanted to learn and they just couldn't learn and nothing bothers me more than people not understanding the bible i mean that's the worst thing in the world i was at a bookstore one time and there was this old couple that they were shopping for a bible and their pastor had convinced them that the only bible that was god's word was the king james if it was good enough for paul it's good enough for us (laughs) it's a joke because paul didn't use the king james so anyways uh 
uh, <laughs> uh, and, and so they found out there were all these different translations, and they said, I don't even know which one to pick. So they started going there, and for the first time in their lives, they'd gone to church their whole life. These people were in their 80s, and for the first time, they were actually understanding the Bible. That is a tragedy. That is a tragedy. I think sometimes people are so concerned that they're going to ask a stupid question that they, they go their whole life. You know, my mom never even read the book of Leviticus until she was in her 50s. In her 50s. That's a tragedy. You shouldn't be going to a church where it's wrong to ask a question that you don't know the answer to. That, that shouldn't be a thing. Uh, anyways, so if you know anybody who, who wants to get in the Bible and they're just really confused, invite them on Sunday nights. We can even turn one of these things into just a question and answer kind of thing if there's somebody having a problem with the Bible. Just it's definitely worth looking into. So uh, I do want to, before I close out here, I do want to encourage you guys to pick up a book. It's called Why I Trust the Bible or Why Should I Trust the Bible? Some of lines that. It's, it's by a guy named Bill Mounts. Um, if you can't find it, you should be able to find it by just typing in Mounts Trust the Bible. Uh, you should be able to find it that way. But if you can't find it, let me know. Uh, it is a very good resource to have and to read through. Um, and I would encourage you guys to pick it up. So we're going to close out then. Lord, thank you for your word. And uh, help us to understand it. And God, for those who understand the Bible very well and who have read it for years and years and years, help them to get more out of it. And for those who are not familiar with the Bible, that they would get read it and get something out of it, God. That there wouldn't you wouldn't be a respecter of persons, Lord, that... That, that for the strong, you'd make them stronger, and for the weak, you'd make them strong. Lord, I just pray you'd uh, speak through your word and help us to understand, and uh, help me to accurately point people to you as we're studying the Bible. Um, and uh, uh, when, when the times inevitably come within the next coming years, that uh, people really um, try to make the main thing evolution. Help us to remember that the main thing is Jesus. And to keep pointing back to that. Because arguments are always just arguments. Help us not to be lovers of arguments. But help us to be lovers of your word. And lovers of people. That would point them to you God. We love you. Amen. Okay. Well. Adios. Next week we'll look at Leviticus and Numbers.